currently have no additional participants. We will wait until we have additional participants to move forward. Okay, we'll start now. Welcome to the forum on LVCC redistricting. My name is Marlene Drinkwine, and I'm happy to be your host for this evening. I am the Vice President of Business Services. Here with us today, we also have Erin Murphy. Erin, would you introduce yourself, please? Thank you, Marlene. My name is Erin Murphy. I work at Long Beach City College. I am the Director of Special Projects, and I'm happy to be here this evening. Thank you. 
Also with us are our partners with Redistricting Partners. Kimmy, would you introduce yourself and your team for us, please? Sure. I'm Kimmy Shigatani. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for Redistricting Partners. And Sophia, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, good evening. My name is Sophia Garcia. I'm the GIS and Outreach Director with Redistricting Partners. Thank you so much. With that, I'm going to provide an overview of the district's efforts thus far and then turn it over to redistricting partners to discuss their process and to provide their draft maps. Thank you. Next slide, please. The goals of this community forum is to have engagement with the public on the redistricting process. This redistricting process focuses only on Long Beach Community College District and not any of our neighboring uh, governmental agencies. We are seeking constructive input from the public to help inform this process. The public may participate in this process or in the specific forum through the Q&A in the chat as well as comment limited to three minutes per comment. Next slide, please. The LBCCC board was established in 1978 as a separate entity from the Long Beach Unified School District. In 1996, those trustees moved to specific trustee areas rather than being generally elected. Currently, our trustees serve four-year terms with elections in even numbered years a staggered basis so that not all the trustees are seeking election in the same year. Next slide, please. This slide provides for you our current five trustees and their terms. As you can see, three terms expire in December 2022, and then the remaining two, two years following that in 2024. On the next slide, you'll see a map of our current trustee areas. Next slide, please. Each decennial census requires us to revisit our maps to ensure that our maps reflect the population growth and an even distribution of the population in each of the trustee areas. This effort is reviewing the 2020 census data and the trustee areas. Next slide, please. This slide and the following slide reflect our timelines. As you can see, this effort started in July of 2021. Recent efforts include the posting on November 15th of a mapping tool to our webpage on redistricting. This mapping tool allows the public to create their own suggested maps and to submit those maps to us. And we do invite all the public to visit this page and to utilize the tool. November 17th, the initial draft maps were presented to the Board of Trustees for discussion. Next slide, please. Which brings us to today's activity, our virtual community forum to seek additional input from the community. I will add that we earlier did conduct a survey of the community in which the community was able to also provide input. Following the conclusion of this forum, we will continue with redistricting partners and their efforts to continue to refine the draft maps with maps to be provided to the Board of Trustees in January for their final approval with submission to with um, submission to uh, the LA County Register Recorder's Office by February 28th. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to redistricting partners.
Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Marlene, for that background information. Again, my name is Sophia Garcia. I'm the GISN Outreach Director with Redistricting Partners. And our portion of this workshop will be to talk about the process that we use for drafting plans and then also to go through the three draft plans that we have here this evening. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, wonderful. So uh, today what we'll cover again is the redistricting basics. We'll talk about the traditional redistricting principles. We'll review the concept communities of interest and what that means and what that criteria is uh, for this process. We'll talk about the ways that the public can give their community of interest testimony. And we also have uh, the public hearing schedule. And again, we'll talk about the draft maps as well. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So what is redistricting? Redistricting is the process of adjusting district lines every 10 years after the release of the US Census. Some of the most well-known examples are our state uh, congressional and legislative districts. And here in California, those are being done by an independent redistricting commission. And uh, while we have the state doing their process, we have a lot of local jurisdictions going through this as well. So if you're here this evening, we're here for the Long Beach Community College redistricting process, and they must go through this, as Marlene mentioned, uh, because of, we have that new 2020 population data. So we have to look at the districts and see if we need to rebalance them. Another note is that beyond creating districts of equal population, redistricting also serves to empower local communities and preserve voting rights. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Our traditional redistricting principles are principles that we have as an outline to prevent a district from becoming a gerrymander. They're also criteria that have been up, upheld nationally by courts and are the industry uh, best practice and standard when drafting maps and when we have any final plan. The and these are also in ranked criteria order. So the first criteria and the whole reason why we're here, why we're redistricting a little bit later this year is because of that criteria of creating districts of relatively equal size. And there's uh, quite a bit of weight for this particular criteria. Uh, one of those is to note that when we're talking about this criteria, we're talking about the total population. We're discussing people, not citizens. So we're talking about people who filled out the 2020 census uh, survey on April 1 of 2020. We're also here talking about relatively equal size. So the board is not mandated to create districts of exactly equal size. They have some room, which is a total plan deviation of 10%, which they're allowed to have uh, for their full district plans. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about those deviation, what that means and why the board, regardless of whatever plans they look like, will have to make some adjustments. Uh, we're also, uh, for this criteria, when we talk about census data, we're also synonymously talking about census geography. Uh, so our census geography comes in at uh, the smallest format, which is those census blocks. And so we have an online tool where you'll be able to use and get uh, specific census blocks to create districts. We know a lot of folks here in California are familiar with census tracts, and those are our larger geography. And again, folks who did that 2020 census outreach may be familiar with that census tract geography. So again, that's our number one criteria. It's the first thing that we look at while we're drawing districts. Uh, once we look at that, the other criteria is to create districts that are contiguous. And so what this means is that they geographically touch one another. They shouldn't hop or jump over a district. You do have an island here uh, for your districts. And so uh, we will, we, when we look at the draft maps, we look at how does that island uh, function and work uh, with the district as a whole. And so even though we have this criteria of contiguous districts, we do have that island there and it will be, you know, remain to still be part of your district. Maintaining communities of interest is a high criteria. It is really a criteria that has been elevated throughout this 2021 process. And we go in further in depth with this in the next slides where we talk more about this concept and how folks can give their community input for their process. 
Another criteria that the board can look at is to look at additional government lines. So this can be city boundaries, county boundaries, local government boundaries. In our presentation, we have neighborhood boundaries, which are a criteria that has been elevated throughout this process. And so the board can um, ask or direct us to look at additional data sets that have been made available through the Bureau or through the district. The last criteria is to keep districts or create districts that are compact. And when we talk about compactness, we're discussing this in two different ways. Uh, one way is an appearance. So does it appear to look like a shape that we're familiar with or in function? So again, we mentioned that island. So how does that island functionally uh, work with the district? How do folks functionally get from that district uh, to the mainland, to the island? And so those are two different ways that we look at compactness. Another note here is just because you have a district that looks a little funny, may have some boundaries that look a little weird, doesn't necessarily mean that it is being um, gerrymandered. Again, compactness is the lowest criteria here, and so the board has a lot of other things that they can look at throughout this process. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So now we're going to focus on uh, communities of interest, and we'll go to the next slide. So communities of interest, uh, what that means is that it, it really uh, places a community narrative and uh, knowledge of folks who are a part of the Long Beach Community College District here at the forefront of this particular process. Uh, communities of interest is the term that we use in redistricting to gather that input. It's about bringing like-minded people together for representation. They're also the building blocks of districts and there's a quite a variety of communities of interest that we can hear because we are talking about how people relate to the district, what their narrative is, what their story is. We wanna remind ourselves that they could be subjective and that we wanna remain open-ended and as inclusive as possible while we're listening to testimony. Uh, we may hear competing communities of interest testimony throughout this process, and that will be the job of the board to then direct us on which way um, to go as they listen through this process. So we welcome everyone as they come forward and wanna give testimony. Some communities uh, that are specifically covered under the Voting Rights Act are um, ethnic groups. So that's Latinos, Asians, and African-Americans. And we'll go to the next slide, which will highlight a specific point. And so while we understand that race um, is and can be included as a community of interest, it cannot be the predominant factor in drawing district boundaries unless there was a Voting Rights Act Section 2 district and we would have that direction come from your legal counsel. And so we understand that a lot of folks uh, recognize that race is a community of interest. And so we have some a slide that will help people think through additional things beyond race that can uh, bond their community together and how they can give testimony for, uh, for this board. So go to the next slide, please. So again, there's such a variety of examples that we can hear throughout this process. We can hear communities of interest that are historical communities, students could come forward, uh, geographic areas, again, neighborhoods is something that we've already heard. Uh, we could hear uh, downtown versus urban areas. Again, we, there's just such a wide variety of examples uh, that we can hear throughout this process. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So what is not a community of interest? And this is uh, the Fair Maps Act doesn't explicitly apply to the Long Beach Community College District. However, we see the Fair Maps Act as a new industry uh, best practice and standard. And so there are some things that if the board uh, were to elect these best practices, uh, these would fall under, uh, under the process. But again, the Long Beach Community College District is not bound to the Fair Maps Act. But under the Fair Maps Act, there are a couple of communities of interest that are explicitly prohibited from being considered as communities of interest. And those are political party affiliation, incumbency, and political candidates. Uh, so that is specifically for the Fair Maps Act. Uh, but we're, but uh, our next point is that you know, 
for folks who are here to give testimony. One thing that's really important to keep in mind is that if you are coming to give testimony and you say the entire district is your community of interest, that's wonderful that you identify with the whole district as, as something that you relate to. Um, however, we are talking about a districted process uh, your college board of trustees are in districts. And so we implore you to think about additional kind of hot spots or areas of your district that you really relate to. And on this point, it's, it's good to note that you're not bound to just come forward and give one community of interest testimony. You can give us multiple because uh, we understand that a lot of us uh, relate and have different facets of us and how we may relate to the district. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this is the, the slide I was alluding to when we were talking about additional ways that we can think of, of race as being a community of interest. And so these questions here really help to serve the community to think through as they're giving their testimony. Again, there's a couple of things that we wanna think through as we're giving community of interest testimony for redistricting. Again, we wanna ensure that the testimony is specifically for the Long Beach Community College District and that it is, is for this process. Um, and so the first question to kind of ask yourself and think through with your community is does the community have a shared culture, characteristic, or bond? So what are those kind of things that bond your community together? Again, if we're thinking beyond race, that could be specific areas that you frequent, cultural events, um, places that you visit or your neighborhood, uh, where you go to school, that can again be a different, different uh, identities. The second one is, is the community geographic in nature or can it be mapped? This one is really important explicitly if you are just giving verbal or written testimony. Uh, so it's helpful if you give us specific street names or specific locations. Um, of course, if you're giving us a map, then we'll really be excited to see what you draw on that map. But again, if you're verbal or written testimony, it's helpful so that we can capture exactly what you would like the board to hear and so that we consider that for the draft maps. The third point is to think about what is your community's relationship with the jurisdiction and how it is affected by policy decisions made by elected officials. And so in this instance, that is your community college board of trustees. So currently, is your community of interest split into different districts? Are you kept together? Does that impact you positively or negatively? Uh, would you benefit from having your community in one neighborhood? And so this piece really touches on that, that piece of representation. And so again, these are three different questions that you can ask yourself as you're coming forward to give your testimony. So we'll go to the next slide, please. One of the ways that you can give your testimony is to provide that feedback on a community of interest form and that is on the website. So it goes through and has those three questions that were on the previous slide, gives you some background information on what communities of interest are, and then just make sure that you send that in and make sure that staff again has um, access to that uh, filled out form. So that's one way that you can submit your community of interest uh, information. So we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, and so there's an additional way that you can give your feedback, which you have an online map. And so that should be linked on your website. But right now we're gonna transition into going through the draft maps. And so we start by just familiarizing ourselves with what the current lines look like. And so when you have the draft plans from us, you're gonna have uh, what we call an atlas, which will have an overlay of your district, which is what this image looks like right here. And it's kind of zoomed out from the mainland because again, you have that island in your district. It also is gonna have a data table specifically for that draft. And then each district will have uh, specific information on there. So this is again, what your current lines look like. And we'll go to the next slide, please. And we have the data table and we'll go to the next slide, which I believe is gonna highlight some numbers for us. Uh, so here, we, when we talked about that total plan deviation, what we're looking at is on this data table is the column that says deviation percent. And so what that is, is it's gonna tell us the uh, percentage uh, negatively or positively of population in a specific district. And to get that total plan deviation, we're taking 
the most populated district and the least populated district and adding that difference together. And so when we do that here for your current lines with the 2020 data, we have a total plan deviation of 11.5%. And again, we noted at the beginning of this presentation that the board must have a plan that is under 10%. And so regardless of whatever plan is adopted, the board is going to at least have to make some changes to make sure that it's under that 10% that threshold. So that's something important to keep in mind as we move forward. So we'll go to the next slide, please. And we're going to start going into our draft plans. So this evening, we have three draft plans that we're gonna talk about. We have draft plan A2, draft plan B2, and we also have a draft plan C. And so there is um, a draft plan A and B, but we uh, were given, uh, we went back and made some amendments to those plans. And so the draft plan A2 is our minimal change plan, which makes minimal changes um, to follow high lines and adjust for or highways, excuse me, and adjust for populations. So we'll go to the next slide and it's gonna show us an overlay of the current districts. Uh, so if we, and we have a zoomed in uh, version of this and you'll be able to kind of zoom in with your own PDF. But what we wanna look at here for the overlay is that on the mainland, you can see that there's those black bold lines and those are the proposed draft plan A2 lines. And the color underneath are what the current lines look like. And so we can see there's some minimal changes between uh, District 5 and um, District 4. And so again, minimal changes between 1 and 2. And we'll go to the next slide, please. We also have an overlay with neighborhoods. And if we go to the next slide, we'll have that zoomed in version so that folks can see that more clearly. Uh, we did create an atlas that will have uh, on those individual packets the specific names of the neighborhoods, but when we are creating this and if we added all those names to this overlay, it would be uh, really cluttered and difficult to read, but you will have um, access to those to look at those specific neighborhoods. And again, for our draft plan A2, it's our minimal change plan. It uh, has a total plan deviation of 2.5%, so well below that 10% that is allowable. And it makes minimal adjustments to follow highway lines and adjust for the population. So we'll go to the next slide. Julie is going to give us the data table. Um, and again, here for our total plan deviation, we will take our most populated district here, which is District 3, at 1.3% and our least populated district, which is a two at negative 1.2. And we add that difference together and that's how we get that 2.5. So we'll go to the next slide. And now we're gonna look at B2. So it's gonna be in a similar format that we saw with our A2 plan. So we have the overview of our B2 plan and we'll go to the next slide. Um, and here we can see there has been more changes made to what the current lines look like. And the base for our B2 plan is we adjusted for to neighborhood boundaries. And we'll go to the next slide and I'll talk you through kind of what those changes look like. And we'll go to the next slide so we can zoom in and see it more clearly. So for our draft plan B2, again, it adjusts for neighborhood lines. It moves um, all of Lindbergh into District 1. Um, it moves all of Los Cerritos into District 2, so making those neighborhoods whole. It also moves um, California Heights into District 5 to make that whole. It moves Artcraft Manor and Los Altos uh, south into District 4 to make those whole. It moves a small portion of St. Mary's into District 3 to make that whole. It places Rose Park into District 3 to make that whole. And Alamitos Beach and North Alamitos Beach are whole in District 3. And the airport or area is whole into District 5. So again, we've adjusted uh, to follow neighborhood boundaries as a base for this plan. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see that this is also well below that total plan deviation of 10%. We also have the total plan deviation of 2.5% for this plan. And we'll go to the next slide and it'll discuss the, the next map, which is our draft plan three. 
Um, so we'll go to the next slide. We see the overview here. Again, we this one is uh, minimal adjustments. We're gonna see the biggest adjustment with our district two, where we take uh, Los Cerritos and Sutter and we place that into district three. So we'll go to the next slide. Where we see those neighborhoods and the next slide where we can zoom in. Uh, so we see that um, Los Cerritos and Sutter, excuse me, are moved into District 2. We place Lindbergh into District 1. California Heights is moved into District 1. And then a small portion of St. Mary's is moved into District 3. But the biggest uh, kind of move here from our original plan, the or minimal change plan, is those uh, now creating that point to keep Los Cerritos and Sutter whole into that District 2. And so those are our, our draft plans. And we'll go to the next slide to show that this plan also is well below that total plan deviation of 10%. Here we have a higher deviation of 3.1%, uh, but still it's, that's a pretty small percentage. And when we're talking about solely the total plan deviations, having a plan uh, and just looking at that and looking at one that has um, a smaller deviation that in itself doesn't necessarily make it a better plan or a worse plan. We're just making sure that for all these draft plans and the final plan, our number is under that, that 10%. So that's um, one thing that we're looking at. Again, we saw how much we have to consider with all those criteria. And we'll go to the next slide, please. And that's the our portion of the presentation. And again, all of these should be available and you'll have those atlases. Uh, where you'll be able to look at those and all of them also have a uh, web-based map so you can zoom into those and look at specific streets uh, because we know that your overlay it has to be a little bit further away because of that island uh, so we'll we'll hand it back to staff now to to continue with the workshop thank you so much sophia and with that, if you are a participant and attendee in this webinar, we welcome your comments and questions either through the Q&A feature, or you may raise your hand and you may have up to three minutes to make a verbal comment. And it appears that we have no questions or comments. Please do be reminded that you may go to our redistricting webpage and submit your comments there through the survey, or you may also use the mapping tool to submit an alternate map. Thank you so much for your attendance. We appreciate your input, and we hope to hear more information from you soon.